maybe while we're getting set up, it'd be helpful for us to just quickly, quickly go around the room and say our names, um, just so we all know each other. Um, so I'm one of the moderators. I'm, I'm Keith Bechtel. And I'm Harry Ferguson from Space Telescope. I'm Elin Lazar, which is PhD student at the University of Hertfordshire. And who's the who's the next speaker? Uh, okay, I think it's me. I'm Unna Krishnan. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Yagalone University, Poland. Uh, I'm Leo Shamir from Kansas State University. And then I think um, Alex is the fourth speaker. All right, so let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, if we could go to the next slide. And you can see that, I assume. Yep. 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 We can see that. Yep. So we have the the reminders of the code of conduct, and then why don't we why don't we just go ahead um, to the next slide. Um, so for this, uh, we request that the questions can either be a Zoom raise hand feature or in the, in the Zoom chat um, because the Slack will go to all the breakout rooms. So that's how you get your questions here. And why don't we uh, go ahead with the speakers so we have as much time as possible. So because we have four speakers in this breakout room, uh, we'll have four minutes uh, per, per talk. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, with Ellen. And I will be the enforcer okay. in four minutes. So. so can I start? Or? Please go ahead. Yeah, so just for the newcomers, I'm Ilin Lazar. I'm a PhD in the New University of Hertfordshire. And today I'll talk about an unsupervised machine learning method built to distinguish between different morphological types of galaxies, especially aimed for forthcoming surveys like LSSD. Um, just um, just to mention that um, um, in terms of galaxy morphological classifications, um, we have uh, we have seen um, a significant shift from traditional techniques um, to more automated measures that use um, mainly supervised machine learning and big uh, data surveys such as um, LSST, JWST will produce exabyte scales of data in the coming decade and. Um, for that reason, we require uh, machine learning for fast data processing, but we will also uh, need um, a significant amount of human resources to do the labeling for the training sets. That's if we want to use supervised machine learning. On the other hand, unsupervised machine learning provides uh, more advantages and does not require um, training on labeled data. For this reason, it is an ideal option to be used on data from uh, LSST, for example. Next slide, please. Um, the unsupervised ML algorithm that um, we are using is actually, is actually presented and described in Martin Tal 2020. It's, and its feature space is based on extracting the parse spectrum from patches within multiband survey images. And then in combination with the growing Gas network and different clustering algorithms, we're able to um, decode the visual properties for each object and obtain final morphological clusters for different galaxy types, such as elliptical spirals or even more detailed morphologies. Um, obviously, the biggest advantage of this algorithm is that it can reduce a vast amounts of data to a couple of, um, to a number of uh, galaxy clusters between 100 and 200, each representing a different morphology, as we can see in the next slide, please. Uh, to the left, uh, we have used the algorithm on um, HSC, HSC uh, and HST candles data. And we can notice that the code is able to distinguish between more general morphologies such as ellipticals, spirals, and can go into even more detail um, to looking at clumpy disks or even high rich mergers. Um, to the right, we uh, prove the accuracy of, of the algorithm by um, showing some, uh, by retrieving some um, already known trends of color mass and S4 mass relations for S0 spirals and ellipticals. Um, in the near future, we're planning to release a morphology catalog for HSC DR3 and perform multiple studies 
um, using this method on uh, forthcoming surveys, including LSST. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I... Yep, we'll go ahead to our second speaker. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Unna Krishnan. I'm a PhD student at the Jagiellonian University in Poland. Uh, my research focuses on the environmental dependence of uh, galaxy properties, uh, which is being supervised by Agnieszka Pollo and Anna Durkaretz. So the uh, environmental dependence of galaxy properties have been uh, explored previously using galaxy two-point correlation function. Uh, in my work, I use a mark correlation function, uh, which is estimated similar to two-point correlation function, except that the galaxies are weighted using different properties. So the marked correlation function, which is estimated using different properties, can be compared to know which property better catches the small scale clustering. So we have recently used this tool uh, in data from the Gamma survey. And the paper has been accepted recently. And this is the archive ID. You can have a look at it. Uh, so next slide, please. So here I quickly summarize the major conclusions uh, on the x-axis. You can see the separation scale between the galaxies and each curve represents the mark correlation function signal obtained from a, a same set of galaxies, but uh, weighted using different properties as labeled, such as the stellar mass, uh, luminosities in various uh, bands and the star formation rate. Uh, mark correlation function being equal to one implies a lack of correlation between that property and the environment. Uh, and greater the deviation from unity implies a stronger correlation. So given that, we can see that stellar mass is the property that is uh, more strongly and positively correlated with environment and star formation rate also correlates, but in a opposite way. And we can also see a nice hierarchy of the luminosity bands uh, in which the K band resembles the stellar mass and U band resembles the star formation rate. So this result is taken uh, from uh, is obtained from a set of galaxies with a flux limit of uh, 19.8 in R band. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to uh, test if the flux limit influences our measurement. So we imposed a flux limit of 17.8 and uh, repeated the measurements. And you can see the results here where the y-axis shows the ratio of both the mark correlation functions and we can see that it is being influenced uh, in most of the scales. So we wanted to explore this uh, further using brighter and fainter flux limited samples, uh, but unfortunately gamma couldn't uh, give enough statistics. Uh, next slide, please. So we uh, thought that uh, Cosmo DC catalog from the LSST desk uh, will be of uh, use here. Uh, we created mock samples from, LSS, uh, from DC2 uh, that resembled our gamma sample and compared their uh, uh, mark correlation functions. Uh, we can see that here the uh, mark correlation functions, uh, they, even though they uh, significantly differ from both the samples, they still follow a hierarchy, which is a green signal to proceed. So we plan to uh, ex extend our analysis using brighter and fainter flex limited samples from the Cosmo DC2 catalog. And I hope we will have the paper out soon. In the meanwhile, please uh, refer to our paper with the gamma data and the link is here. And uh, thank you for your attention and I'm open to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy Krishnan. Uh, now we go on to Lior. Okay, so we're going to have uh, about 10 billion galaxies imaged by Varubin Observatory. We can assume that most of those galaxies are going to be like Hubble sequence galaxies, regular galaxies, but some of those galaxies are going to be different, are going to be rare galaxies. Even rare one in a million object would appear, will appear in the data set about 10,000 times. And the question is how we find them. Next slide. So some objects, we know that they are rare, but we know what they look like. Ring galaxies is one example. Gravitational lenses is another example. Uh, they're relatively rare, but we know that they exist and we know what they look like. So we can train a machine learning algorithm. We can develop another algorithm. Uh, that's an example from uh, PenStar. These are ring galaxies that were identified by an algorithm uh, in PenStars. And gravitational lenses is another example. Next slide. 
Yeah, but there are some galaxies that could exist that we don't know they exist. We don't know what shape they have. <clears throat> we still want to find them. But if we don't know that they exist, we cannot train a machine learning algorithm or another algorithm <clears throat> to find them. So in that case, we need to use super, uh, unsupervised machine learning, like novelty detection. Uh, these are examples from uh, HST, from Pensters, and from Sloan. These are all galaxies, examples of galaxies that were identified by an unsupervised machine learning uh, algorithm. It's not as clean as it looks here. The algorithm it, it produces a lot of noise, a lot of false positives. But uh, it's still manageable. Uh, evidently, it can uh, it identify those either the potential lenses that you see or other uh, weird uh, forms of galaxies that you see. Uh, so it is manageable, and definitely, it's better than not using an algorithm at all. In that case, uh, it's not doable. Uh, next slide, please. And we know that one of the, the strengths of Rubin is the temporal resolution. It can identify events, and we can, uh, if it can identify events, maybe it can identify also extragalactic events. So galaxies are not supposed to change in a few days or in a few years. That's unlikely. But for instance, they can be obscured by objects inside the Milky Way. And we can identify those events by keep scanning uh, those galaxies. That's an example from Sloan. Uh, that's, uh, that, in that, that case is probably not real, it's probably some sort of an artifact there, but it was identified by an algorithm automatically. So it's, um, so in this case, it's probably an artifact, but next time it could be real, we could use those algorithms to identify these events and study them. Yeah. Great. That's it. For, Thank you. That's it for me. And I think now I pause the recording. Oh, uh, that's not this. That's the screen sharing. Um, I might have to get back to my main menu to pause the recording. Hi. I'm Unnukrishnan. I'm a PhD student at uh, Jagiellonian University in Poland. I'm Leo Shamir from Kansas State University. And then our, our fourth speaker is, is Alex, who we'll hear from in a bit. All right. So, yes, yeah, so we're, we're recording now and bringing up the slides. Um, so let's let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation. I think since we've we've covered the other reminders, um, we'll do the uh, we'll do the questions by raised hand or posting them in the Zoom chat. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, with Ellen. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so here we present an unsupervised machine learning method to distinguish between different morphological types of galaxies, especially aimed at particular surveys such as LSST. Um, um, in terms of galaxy morphological classifications, um, over the past couple of decades, we have seen um, a significant shift from traditional techniques uh, towards more automated measures um, that use mainly supervised machine learning. Um, but um, big data surveys such as um, LSST or JWST will produce uh, exabytes class of data in the coming decade. And for that reason, we will require machine learning for faster data processing we will also need a significant amount of human resources to do them labeling for the training sets. That's if we want to use supervised machine learning. Um, on the other hand, unsupervised machine learning does provides um, some advantages, and that is that, that, that it does not require training on label data. And for that reason, it is quite ideal for to be used on data uh, from LSST, for example. Next slide, please. Um, the unsupervised ML algorithm we are um, proposing is actually described in detail in Martin, Martin et al. 2020, and its feature space is based on extracting the power spectrum from patches within multiband survey images. And then um, in combination with the growing neural gas network and different clustering algorithms, we are able to uh, decode the real properties for each object and finally obtain morphological clusters for different galaxy types, such as ellipticals or spirals. Uh, obviously, the biggest advantage that this algorithm provides is that it can 
reduce significant amounts uh, of data uh, to just um, a number of uh, galaxy clusters between 100 and 200, let's say, uh, each representing a different morphology. So uh, as we can see in the next slide, uh, if you see, next slide, please. To the left, we are uh, showing an example using the algorithm on HSC, uh, HSC data and HST candles data, uh, where we basically uh, can notice that the code can uh, differentiate quite nicely between more general morphologies such as uh, spirals and ellipticals and can go into even more detail looking at high H2 regions uh, within um, uh, spirals and uh, higher H2 mergers as well. Um, to the right, we prove the accuracy of the algorithm by um, um, retrieving, uh, reproducing some, um, some known results, already known results from the literature. Um, of uh, color mass and s far mass relations for um, S0 spirals and ellipticals. Um, in the near future, we're actually planning to release some morphology catalog for HSC DR3 and uh, perform numerous studies on uh, different subfields uh, in cosmology and extragalactic research uh, using this method on, uh, up, on data from upcoming surveys. Um, and of course, LSST. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can use the Slack just by uh, order. <laughs> great, great, thank you. Yeah. So we'll Hello, have uh, Krishnan present next. Hello, everyone. My name is Unnakrishnan. Um, so my research focuses on the environmental dependence of uh, galaxy properties. So this uh, field has been explored previously uh, using galaxy two-point correlation functions. Uh, in my work, I use marked correlation function, which is estimated similar to two-point correlation function, except that the galaxies are weighted uh, using different properties. So the marked correlation function estimated using different properties can be compared to know which property better catches the small-scale clustering. This tool, uh, we have been, we have used this tool recently uh, from, uh, with the data from the gamma survey and the work has been accepted and this is the archive link, you can have a look at it. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So here I quickly summarize the major conclusions. Uh, so on x-axis, you can see the separation scale between the galaxies and uh, each curve represents the marked correlation function signal obtained from the same set of galaxies, but weighted using different uh, properties as labeled, uh, such as the stellar mass, uh, luminosities in various uh, pass bands and the star formation rate. Mark correlation function being equal to one implies a lack of correlation between that property and the environment and greater the deviation is greater the correlation is. So the, given that uh, we can see that the stellar mass uh, is a property which is the most uh, positively correlated with environment and star formation rate correlates in the opposite way. Also, we can see a nice uh, hierarchy of the luminosity uh, bands uh, in which the K band uh, resembles the stellar mass and the U band uh, follows the star formation rate. This result has been uh, taken, uh, has been, uh, is from, the, from a set of galaxies with the flux limit of 19.8 in R band. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so we wanted to check whether the our flex limit influences our measurements. Uh, so we imposed a flex limit of 17.8 and then repeated the measurements. And you can see the ratio of the marked correlation functions here. And uh, it is clear that uh, this influence, the flex limit actually influences the measurement and we wanted to explore it further using more brighter and fainter uh, samples. But unfortunately, gamma could not provide enough statistics for the same. Uh, next slide, please. So we, so we, sorry, so we believe that the Cosmo DC2 catalog from the LSST desk will be of uh, use here. And as a preliminary test, we have taken a mock uh, sample from the DC2, which resembles our gamma sample, and compare the measurements. Uh, you can see that the mark correlation function even though they do not, they significantly differ between both the samples, uh, they still preserve the hierarchy, uh, which is a uh, green signal for us to proceed. And so we plan to extend our studies with brighter and fainter flex limited samples from DC2. And uh, I hope this paper will be out soon. 
uh, in the meanwhile please have refer to our paper with the gamma data and thank you for your attention and feel free to ask any question great thank you very much next up is uh, leo yeah okay so um for our moving we're going to have about 10 billion galaxies in, in the database and we can assume that most of those galaxies are on the Hubble sequence, like regular galaxies, but some of those galaxies are going to be rare types of objects. And even very rare one in a million type of object is going to appear about 10,000 times in the database. And the question is how we can find them. Next slide, please. So some objects are rare, but we know their shape and that, and we can use that to train either a machine learning algorithm or another algorithm to find them. That example, the example in this slide, that's ring galaxies in pen stars. And th those galaxies were identified automatically. It's part of a large catalog of ring galaxies were identified automatically uh, by an algorithm. So an, an algorithm was able to produce a fairly clean catalog uh, automatically um, it would, that would have taken uh, an, uh, an unmanageable amount of time if we try to do it manually. Next slide, please. Uh, but unlike ring galaxy or gravitational lenses or things that we know are rare, but we know that they exist and we know what, what we're looking for, there could be objects of all kinds of weird types that we want to find, but we don't know they exist. And if we don't know they exist, then it makes it difficult to train either a machine learning system or another algorithm uh, based on them. So in that case, we can use unsupervised machine learning. What we see here those are galaxies that were identified automatically, either in HST, PenStars, uh, Sloan, by an algorithm. And these are kind of galaxies that are not necessarily on the Hubble 6 and might, might look a little different than most galaxies, but they were uh, identified auto automatically. It's not, the output of the algorithm is not as clean as it might seem here. The, the unsupervised learning produces a lot of false positives and needs to clean up, but uh, it's obviously a lot better than not using any algorithm at all because that makes it uh, impractical. So the algorithm it might not be super, very, very clean, but it, it's manageable, it makes it practical. Next slide, please. One of the strengths of the Rubin Observatory is its temporal resolution. It can monitor and identify events, and if it can identify events, why not extra galactic events? Uh, that are reflected by the morphology of the galaxy. So a galaxy is not supposed to change in a few days or in a few years, that's unlikely. But if, for instance, the galaxy can be obscured by an object from inside the Milky Way. That's example from Sloan, something that was de detected automatically by an algorithm. This case is probably some sort of an artifact. It's probably not ast astronomical, but the algorithm was able to identify it, was unable to pick it up. And if we apply it to a Rubin Observatory, we might be able to find some that are not artifacts that are real astronomical events. Thank you. Thank you.